Inflammatory responses in the immune system work with other defenses to provide protection from harmful microorganisms and cells. This protection is by neutralizing, eliminating, or destroying organisms that invade the internal environment. After this lesson, you will be able to explain the differences between inflammation and immunity in terms of cells, functions, and features, Use knowledge of physiology to describe the basis for the five cardinal manifestations of inflammation and interpret a white blood cell count with differential to indicate no immune problems, immune suppression, infection, or an allergic reaction. Immunocompetent components are inflammation, antibody-mediated immunity, and cell-mediated immunity. Inflammation provides immediate protection against the effects of tissue injury and invading foreign proteins. Antibody-mediated immunity involves antigen-antibody interactions to neutralize, eliminate, or destroy foreign proteins. Antibodies are produced by B cells. Cell-mediated immunity involves many white blood cell actions and interactions, influence and regulate the activities of antibody-mediated immunity and inflammation by producing and releasing cytokines. So let's talk about immunity. Self-tolerance is the body's immune system capability of recognizing one's own cells. Each cell has a marker or protein, also known as an antigen, that signifies the type of cell. Human leukocyte antigens, unique proteins, are found on the surface of all body cells of a single individual and serve the person as a cellular fingerprint. Undifferentiated cells are the immature stem cells produced in the bone marrow. Stem cells have more than one potential outcome identifying them as pluripotent cells. Agglutination occurs during the antibody binding process when antibodies link antigens together to form large and small immune complexes. Lysis is an immune response of destroying invading microorganisms by breaking the cell membrane. Complement activation and fixation are actions triggered by some classes of antibodies that can remove or destroy antigens. Precipitation is the formation of large insoluble antigen antibody complexes during the antibody binding process. Inactivation is the process of binding an antibody to an antigen to cover the antigen's active site and to make the antigen harmless without destroying it, also called neutralization. Innate native immunity, also known as natural immunity, is a type of immunity that cannot be developed or transferred from one person to another and is not an adaptive response to exposure or invasion by foreign proteins. Adaptive immunity is the immunity that a person's body makes or receives as an adaptive response to invasion by organisms or foreign proteins. It occurs either naturally or artificially through lymphocyte responses and can be either active or passive. Active occurs when the body responds by making specific antibodies against antigens in an active role, most effective and longest lasting. Passive occurs when antibodies against an antigen are in a person's body, but were not created there. It provides only immediate and short-term protection. This is just a quick review of the proteins on a human cell plasma membranes, and it consists of nonspecific human membrane proteins, tissue-specific membrane proteins, and individual recognition proteins. Okay, first the immune system will determine cells to either be self or non-self cells. The stem cell differentiation and maturation process initiates in the bone marrow as it progresses through the stages and differentiates the type of cell it becomes. 
Table 19-2 on page 307 of your textbook gives you values of a white blood cell differential for peripheral blood representing a normal count. You need to review this table. It includes SEGs, bands, monos, lymphs, eosins, and basos. These individual white blood cells can indicate whether someone is having an inflammatory or immune response. Now we are going to discuss the immune system. The function can vary. Neutrophil function provides protection after invaders, especially bacteria, enter the body. If a patient is exhibiting an immune system response, they could have leukocytosis, which is an elevated white blood cell count. They may even exhibit a fever, the B cells become sensitized to a specific foreign protein and produce antibodies directed specifically against that protein. If the body has natural antibodies, at this point they will begin to function. T lymphocytes work with B cells to start and complete antigen-antibody interactions. There are decreases in the immune system with aging. There is a probable defect in neutrophil function. Leukocytosis does not occur during episodes of acute infection. Older adults may not have a fever during inflammatory or infectious episodes. The total number of colony forming B lymphocytes and the ability of these cells to mature into antibody secreting cells are diminished. There is a decline in natural antibodies, decreased response to antigens, and reduction in the amount of time the antibody response is maintained. Thymic activity decreases with aging and the number of circulating T lymphocytes decrease. Let's discuss leukocyte protection. It provides recognition for self versus non-self. It provides destruction of invaders. It provides production of antibodies. It provides complement activation. And it provides production of cytokines. Let's discuss inflammation. Inflammation is immediate but short term. It has no memory. It's nonspecific, can be started by almost any event, and takes place the same way. Severity depends on the injury or the invader. If the inflammation response is excessive, it can result in tissue damage. Inflammation helps start the immune response, and it occurs only in vascularized tissue. Neutrophils are about 55 to 70 percent of the normal white blood cell. They mature in about 12 to 14 days. Their life cycle is 12 to 18 hours, and they're protected by vagocytosis and enzyme activity. They take part in only one episode. Macrophages start out as monocytes. They're large size and they can recognize self and non-self. They have a long life and take part in many fights. Basophils have granules containing chemicals. Isonophils act against parasitic infections and also limit inflammatory reactions. Vagocytosis, a key process of inflammation that engulfs and destructs invading microorganisms. First we have to have an exposure and invasion. Attraction is needed as the second step because phagocytosis can occur only when the white blood cell comes into direct contact with the target. Some substances attract neutrophils and macrophages. Damaged tissue secrete the chemotaxins and release debris that can combine with the surface of invading foreign proteins. Adherence is important because vagocytosis requires that the vagocytic cell first bind to the surface of the target. Recognition occurs when the vagocytic cell sticks to the surface of the target cell and recognizes it as a non-self cell, which leads to cellular ingestion. Then we have vagosome formation ending with degradation. 
Okay, so let's discuss a few clinical manifestations. Okay, so let's discuss the clinical manifestations at the systemic level. The three primary systemic changes associated with acute inflammation are fever, leukocytosis, and an increase in circulating plasma proteins. Acute inflammation can be verified or implied by a number of blood tests. There is an increase in leukocyte level including a left shift, an increased ESR rate, and an elevated fibrinogen level. Now let's talk about the cellular level. The patient can experience uh, warmth, redness, swelling, pain, limited function, and aberrant motion. Now let's discuss the stages of inflammation. Stage 1, the vascular stage. There is constriction of small veins, dilation of the arterioles in the uh, area, and then redness and warmth occur. There's an increased nutrition to injured tissue, and then hyperemia and endemia can occur. There will be capillary leakage, allowing blood plasma to leak into the tissue. They'll have increased swelling and pain. Uh, they may have dilutes toxins, and it lasts 24 to 72 hours. Then we have stage 2, the cellular stage. There could be exudate and pus form, uh, neutrophilia or seen, usually about an increase five times in 12 hours, and then cascading starts. Stage 3, the tissue stage. During this stage, there's going to be tissue repair and replacement. It begins at the time of injury, and the healthy tissue left begins to divide, and then white blood cells trigger angiogenesis, and scar tissue is then formed. Cells that don't divide just form scars. Now we're going to talk about the antibody. There is antibody-mediated immunity. Also called humoral immunity, it's produced by the B lymphocytes. It becomes sensitized to specific foreign protein, and then B cells start as stem cells in the bone marrow. They travel to the secondary lymphoid tissue where they mature. Then we have antigen-antibody interaction. This is usually due to an exposure or an invasion, and it has to be a large exposure or invasion. The antigen recognition uh, recognizes as a non-self. There is lymphocyte sensitization, and then a single naive B cell is sensitized only once. There will be antibody production. Antibodies bind to the antigen, forming an immune complex. Antibody binding attracts leukocytes to the complex, then there's neutralization, destruction, or elimination of the antigen. On re-exposure to the same antigen, the sensitized lymphocytes and their progeny produce large amounts of antibody specific to the antigen. Okay, first we're going to discuss cell-mediated immunity. There's T lymphocytes such as T cells and natural killer cells. There's helper inducer T cells, there's suppressor T cells, there's cytotoxic cells, and then there's natural killer cells. Cytokines are small protein hormones produced by many white blood cells and can be monokines if made by macrophages, neutrophils, eosinophils, or monocytes. If made by T cells, they are called lymphokines. Cytokines act like messengers and they bind to a receptor cell and then it changes its activity. Some examples would be interleukins, interferons, colony stimulating factor, and tumor necrosis factor. Okay, I want to touch base a little bit about transplant rejection. There are three types, the hyperacute, the acute, and then the chronic. During hyperacute, it begins immediately and is an antibody-mediated response. The host has a pre-existing antibodies in donated organ. The clots form, cascades released, and with ischemic necrosis as a result. There is an increased risk if the different ABO blood is transfused or they've had multiple blood transfusions, multiple pregnancies, or had had previous transplants.
Acute rejection usually occurs one week to three months after transplant. There's vasculitis that causes blood vessel necrosis. T cells and natural killer cells invade, causing lysis of organ cells. Uh, drug management will be done to hopefully save the organ. Then we have chronic rejection. Occluded vessels and fibrotic scar tissues form. An example is an accelerated graft atherosclerosis. Cell-mediated immunity responses contribute the most to the rejection process. Maintenance therapy of immunosuppressant meds are helpful. Some examples are cyclosporine, neural, gengraft. Uh, kidney transplants may use monoclonal antibodies. And then rescue therapy is using globulin therapy. This concludes the lesson, Inflammation and the Immune Response. If you have any questions related to this lesson, contact the instructor. There is a video in this lesson section that can assist you with grasping the understanding of inflammation and the immune response. Please review the video.